G'day, Mark Griffith here and welcome to Biodiversity Shorts. How to film hummingbirds. Take two cameras and point them at a flower. It helps if the flower is a heliconia and that we are in the cloud forests of South America. And if we're lucky, along comes a hummingbird. Now previously, I lived in Ecuador and there one of my hobbies was filming hummingbirds. What you're about to see is the best of my footage that I filmed while living there. Let's go. Now this hummingbird is the violet fronted brilliant, so named for its iridescent blue feathers that are only really seen when they are caught in the correct light. The violet fronted brilliant is a territorial species and in this case has chosen to live in the jungle gardens of our hostel. With my love for hummingbirds I planted as many different nectar giving species as I could. Early on I decided that hummingbird feeders were not an option as they are the ideal vector for hummingbird killing fungi which thrive in this humidity. With virgin cloud forest on all sides the gardens become a perfect oasis for all sorts of wildlife including hummingbirds. As our violet fronted brilliant collects nectar from the flowers in his territory I'm going to give you some numbers that describe the hummingbird family. Hummingbirds first evolved 42 million years ago, somewhere in Europe. 22 million years ago, they reached South America. The rufous hummingbird migrates 2,000 miles along the Rocky Mountains. Hummingbirds have approximately 1,500 feathers, the fewest of any bird species. The heart rate of the blue-throated mountain gem has been measured at 1,260 beats per minute. The ruby-throated hummingbird migrates 500 miles non-stop across the Gulf of Mexico. There are 338 different species of hummingbird, most of them in South America. The male Anna's hummingbird approaches 100 km per hour in its courtship dive. Bee hummingbirds can beat their wings at up to 80 beats per second. This brilliant flaps his wings at around 30 beats per second. Hummingbirds can digest nectar into energy in just 20 minutes. The longest recorded lifespan of a hummingbird is 12 years. Hummingbirds can easily pull 10 Gs in a turn. Fully grown, bee hummingbirds weigh less than 2 grams. To save weight, females only have one ovary, and male hummingbirds have no penis. With such an energetic method of flight, hummingbirds typically spend most of their waking hours perched. In addition to their routine visiting of flowers, they will take to the wing to catch passing insects, although not all flights are successful. Territorial species will also aggressively defend their patch using physical force if necessary. Aerial combat amongst hummingbirds is avoided if possible, and in this case our violet fronted brilliant simply makes himself heard. Nearby, amongst the giant bamboo, the sparkling violet ear also watches over his small territory. The sparkling violet ear is slightly larger and more vocal. Like the violet fronted brilliant, the sparkling violet ear also visits the red veined flowering maple. This flower produces large amounts of nectar and will replenish itself every hour or so. As a result, it attracts many different species of hummingbird. This includes the trap lining green hermit, more about trap lining later, the white tailed hill star, and the bronzy inca. All of these are mid-sized hummingbirds. To give you an idea of scale, this flower is about this big. Also known as the Chinese lantern, this plant produces flowers constantly throughout the year. From their bud, they grow quickly, this time lapse being filmed over four days. The orange colour you can see appearing at the base is pollen being produced on the many stamens. The sole purpose of flowers is to transfer this pollen from the stamen of one plant 
to the stigma of another. In this case, you can see the purple stigma stalks at the very bottom of the flower. If we zoom in on this flower, we can see that the stigma already have pollen from another flower stuck to them. Zooming in further, we can just make out the small spikes that help the pollen stick to both the hummingbird and the stigma. Watch closely and you can see the pollen being transferred here to the top of the sparkling violet ear's head. With a little luck, our hummingbird will go on to feed on the flower of a different flowering maple. If some of the pollen is transferred to the second plant stigma, then pollination occurs. Of course, if the hummingbird chooses to go to a different species first, then there is a good chance that the pollen will be lost, and that particular batch of nectar wasted. Plants can increase their chance of pollination simply by producing more flowers with larger amounts of nectar and pollen. Such competition is great for territorial hummingbirds. This pink banana has a few extra tricks to attract visitors. Its petals also make a great perch, a feature that the white-tailed hill star has learnt to take advantage of. The pink banana also retains a little yellow in its flower to attract bumblebees. The pollination relationship between flowers and insects has existed for over 100 million years. Typically, insect attracting flowers are yellow and hummingbird attracting flowers are red. Bees, for example, are red-green colourblind. Most of the flowers in this area are red and insect pollination is less common. The reason for this is that being warm-blooded, hummingbirds remain active in the cold and wet climate of these cloud forests. No matter the weather, hummingbirds still need to feed and the plants benefit. However, for plants, their pollination strategies do not always go to plan. Although the heliconia also displays a little yellow, it does not really want to attract this hawk moth. It has an incredibly long proboscis for its size, and is so gentle that no pollen is transferred as it feeds. With this disregard for the heliconia's pollination strategy, you could say it is stealing the nectar. Many hummingbirds also steal, and this green hermit will simply turn his head sideways slightly to avoid contact with the sticky pollen. The violet-fronted brilliant expertly keeps his chin just far enough away, and he can do this with the help of his relatively long tongue. The long-tailed sylph takes this freeloading to the next level. It has learned to simply punch a hole in the side of the flower with its short and very sharp beak. Initially, this can be a little clumsy, with the sylph having to grip the flower for leverage. However, once punctured, the feeding becomes a lot more elegant and, if you take into account not having to clean himself, a lot more efficient. This blue-grey tanager has also learned how to access the rich supply of nectar. Perhaps, and this is just my own theory, that similar nectar thievery was how hummingbirds first evolved. Another occasional thief is the grey-chinned hermit. Hermits are more ancient than the species we've seen so far, and they diverged from a common ancestor 15 million years ago. They are not territorial and use a more complex method of feeding called traplining. This means that they have a set route visiting many different flowers through the jungle. This route can be quite long, in some cases taking the entire active part of the day to navigate. The booted racket tail is another traplining species. 
I discovered that this female Buddha Dracot tail would only visit this particular bromeliad once between 5 and 5.30 p.m. each day. The bromeliad has very tiny flowers and no doubt is a slow producer of nectar. Trap lining allows hummingbirds to take advantage of all the different flowers that produce less nectar, but to gather enough to stay alive, they must travel larger distances. From the plant's point of view, having your pollen travel large distances is a great advantage. It means that your species can have a much larger range. However, in order to ensure that long-range pollen transfer succeeds, the plant needs to target fewer species of hummingbirds. There is another much larger trap lining species which feeds on a much larger flower, and that flower is our Heliconia. Its flowers are deeply curved, and of the hummingbirds we have seen so far, none of them are good pollinators. This tawny-bellied hermit barely touches the flower. Our violet-fronted brilliant is not the pollinator, nor are the tiny mites that are hitching a ride. The Oropandola is far too big, and it is not the Collared Inca. The wedge-billed hummingbird has the right technique, but it's not the one. The hummingbird I am thinking of diverged from its common ancestor 20 million years ago. During that time, it has co-evolved with the Heliconia. This long relationship has resulted in an extreme adaptation. Unlike all the other visiting species, only the white-tipped sicklebill can reach the large quantities of nectar in the deepest parts of this flower. Heliconia and hummingbird are perfectly matched. Contact with the stigma, stamen and the top of the sicklebill's head is virtually guaranteed. To further improve its chances of pollination, the Heliconia has an amazing trick. There is a trigger inside the flower that is tailored to the curved beak of the sicklebill. When tripped, a small charge of pollen is shot directly onto the hummingbird's head. As far as I am aware, this is the first time that this action has ever been observed in any detail. Moments of discovery like this make all the effort of filming elusive wildlife worthwhile. My name is Mark Griffith, thanks for watching and I will catch you next time.